Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second webinar for 2018. And today we're talking about a very important topic, and that is transitioning to IFRS 15. So today, again, um, as with our previous webinar, it would be myself, Aleta Bossov, and also Kevin Frobers uh, doing uh, the presentation. So a bit of an introduction. What is the content that we will cover in this webinar? First of all, uh, we'll look at 2018, finally, the wait is over, uh, time to, in a way, stop talking and start doing. Uh, we'll also give you a bit of a recap of IFRS 15, very high level. And then Kevin will go on and talk about an approach to transition and the importance of selecting your approach early. Uh, Kevin will work through four worked examples with you um, and then we'll, uh, or I'll get back and we'll talk around next steps and, and whether you need any assistance. So more or less our six sections um, that we will cover today. So if we go on to 2018, uh, the wait is over uh, for for-profit entities within the next two years, there are three new accounting standards, IFRS 15, IFRS 9 and IFRS 16. Now, IFRS 15 and IFRS 9, the effective dates are for years beginning on or after 1 January 2018. 18. So if you've got a 31 December year end, we are already in your first year of mandatory adoption. And if you've got a 30 June year end, we're just a few months away from that first year of mandatory adoption. However, what we found with a number of our clients is that although IFRS 16 uh, will only become effective a year later, a number of clients have been thinking of going for a big bang and early adopt IFRS 16 uh, in order to adopt all three standards simultaneously. So that is available or that option is available to you. So you could do a staged approach where you, you uh, apply IFRS 15 and 9 this year and next year you focus on IFRS 16 or you could go for the big bang. For our not-for-profit clients and entities, uh, we've got a, a quadruple threat. There's four standards impacting them and the additional one for our not-for-profit entities would be AASB 1058, which is an Australian specific standards replacing the problematic AASB 1004 contributions. And then for not-for-profits, uh, the AASB have issued application guidance on how to apply IFRS 15 to not-for-profit entities if it is applicable. Um, and because they've taken a bit of time to get that out, they've also given not-for-profit entities an extension. And that is that you only have to apply IFRS 15 to your not-for-profit entities if it is apl applicable from 1 January 2019. Uh, so really, if you look at those dates, for our not-for-profit entities in this particular year, they should be focusing on IFRS 9. And then next year, we'll be looking at IFRS 15, 16, and 1058. Now, what Kevin and I have found is that not-for-profit entities are actually very eager to understand the potential implications, and especially the interaction action between AASB 1058 and IFRS 15 and we're having a lot of conversations with them on how it would affect their numbers and we can understand that uh, these organizations would like to prepare their users, um, uh, people who make donations, uh, governments who provide um, support to them and grants uh, to understand the numbers and how it would impact their financials. I thought at this stage I might also highlight that BDO issue monthly newsletters and the newsletters are also available on our website and in this month's newsletter we have a focus on these quadruple threat um, for not-for-profit entities. An IFRS 15 recap. So IFRS 15 is why we're here together. Uh, before we look at transition, I think we should just have a, a recap on what the standard is about and what it's going to do. 
Um, so the core principle in the standard is that we will recognize a revenue to depict the transfer of promised goods or services. And another word for promised goods or services would be performance obligations to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects an important circle. It's in italics, expects to be entitled in exchange for those goods or services. Something that's not changed is the fact that revenue can only arise as a result of ordinary activities, um, other income if it's other activities, and that a customer is a party that has contracted with an entity to obtain goods or services that are output of an entity's ordinary activities in exchange for consideration. Hello, Aleta. Yes, Kevin. Hi, it's Kevin. Um, I'd just like to interrupt there and, and actually just bringing a, a point about the expectation and, and hello to all the attendees. Um, coming to you from Sydney today, Aleta's in Melbourne and we're trying a new thing, a remote presentation. Um, on the expect on the expects, I think the the message to be made on on the expects principle is that there is an estimation that is required um, under the new standard. Um, traditionally, what you would have done is recognise revenue as you invoice or as you bill clients, but under the under the core principle, that word expects means that right from the start of the contract, you will be making an estimation of effectively how much you think is ultimately going to hit your bank account. And that, that that's a simplistic way of looking at it. But the expectation means you it's an ongoing estimation right from the start on what you expect to ultimately um, recover um, from from um, from the sale. And that's going to become important when we when we look at our transitions. So I thought I'd just make that point before you move forward. So if we then, thanks Kevin, if we then go on to the five steps, um, you know, the core principle is um, with all due respect to the standard setters, it's, uh, you know, pie in the sky stuff. Uh, but when we come down to the five steps, it's, it becomes re um, real. And we know that we have to follow and apply these steps um, in a particular order and I've seen with many clients and actually also audit staff if you go from step two to step three to step one um, if you get the order wrong your answer is different and the answer is incorrect so it's really important to stick to the order in these steps and the very first step is to identify whether we've got a contract with a customer or contracts with a customer. Part of that step, we also have to consider uh, whether these contracts with the same customer or related parties of that customer should be combined for the purposes of IFRS 15, and that's an important decision. And also as part of step one, on an ongoing basis, we should consider whether we've got contract modifications or whether we've got a new contract and what that would mean. So that links back to what Kevin's just said around the estimation and, and continued thinking about it. But step one is identify the contract, should we combine contracts and are these contracts potentially modified in future? And then in step two, we say, all right, if we've got all the contracts with the customer on the table, what are the separate promises of goods and services and what are the separate performance obligations? Then we go to step three and we say determine the transaction price and that is the total transaction price for all the contracts on the table. Step four, we allocate that transaction price to the separate performance obligations we identified in step two, and we do that on a relative standalone basis. So I don't care what number is actually written into the various contracts, uh, what would a standalone selling price be for the different performance obligations, and we allocate based on those. And then we recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied in step five. I think the purpose um, of this slide is to remind everybody that the um, revenue um, recognition under the new standard is at a contract level. It's not transaction level, it's contract level, and then within that performance obligation level. And this becomes really important when we have things like contract modifications. 
most relationships with customers, especially those that are long-term or ongoing, there will be at some point a modification to the contract or some type of negotiation that changes the terms of the contract. One of the big concepts in IFRS 15 is how do you account for that change? Is it a new contract or is it a modification to the old contract? Now, if I go back to the point I made in the previous slide about estimating the revenue on an ongoing basis, you can see already the problem with that. If you are making an estimation of the um, amount of the consideration you expect to recover or be entitled to right at the start, and then you have a change in terms and conditions, what's going to happen is you will have an ongoing estimation at each reporting date, but you'll also have changes as and when you make uh, changes to the contract. So when, when there are modifications or terminations of contracts and new and, and, and new terms and conditions, a re-estimation will happen. And in, in many cases, under the new standard, you actually might have a cumulative catch-up adjustment where you actually have to make a effectively a prospective adjustment to catch up whatever you were recognizing before those changes. The reason why I'm making that point is in the transition, th th there are two key concepts that we need to have before we go into transition and that's um, variable consideration so estimating your transaction price from the start and as the as and, and as the contract progresses and then modifications as you have changes to the terms and conditions you need to account for those modifications as they happen either by a new contract or, or, or accounting for a new contract or a cumulative catch-up Today's session, we are not dealing with the concepts behind modifications and variable. We just need you to know that they exist. If you don't know what I mean by variable um, and by modifications, we have done um, these in previous webinars in 2017. It's also contained in our publications online. Um, but I just need you to, to recognize the concept of a, of a variable uh, consideration. So what's our estimation of, of, of the revenue we're expecting and a modification when we actually make changes to the terms and conditions. Thank you very much, Kevin. So we'll now really hand over to Kevin to discuss the approach to transition and also work through some worked examples. Thank you, Aleta. And um, this is going to be a, 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 a proper training webinar. Today, we're actually going to get get our get our hands dirty roll up our sleeves and um, they're going to be worked examples with numbers so i so i, I need everybody to to keep their words about them um, as we go into the approach to transition now the approach to transition in the new standard is is actually quite complicated as well um, traditionally when we've transitioned to a new accounting standard we would have used the retrospective method the idea being that you adopt a new accounting policy um, you restate into comparative years and, and you adjust your, 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 your numbers as if you had always applied that accounting policy. Now, under the um, IFRS 15, there are two options available, the retrospective method and the cumulative effect method. And, and, and the, the general um, terms under which each of those two are adopted are, are on the screen. Now, the retrospective method is exactly as it sounds. If you're applying IFRS 15 with a retrospective method, you actually will be retrospectively adjusting your prior year reporting period, so your comparative period. The idea of this is that you make an adjustment at the start of the earliest comparative period presented, um, and the comparative periods show your um, IFRS figures for all contracts as if you had always been apply, uh, uh, applying that. Now, importantly to this, um, this is just um, how you adopt this in your financial statements. So how you present it in your um, financial statements. Do we account for the adjustments through our systems um, by adjusting our comparative periods as a presentation? Um, or do we actually use the cumulative effect method, which really is instead of doing an adjustment to comparative periods in our financial statements, what we do is we actually do a cumulative adjustment to show that effect at the start of the current period. So you, what you'll do is you'll, you'll adjust um, for those open contracts that we are now restating, you make the adjustment at the start of the current period. We call that the date of initial application. So that's the start of the current period that you're adopting in. Um, under the two methods, the retrospective method actually has four what we call practical expedients. That's, you, that's to help you along when you're doing the, the, uh, the adjustments. Those are um, practical expedients to make it a bit easier. 
Under the cumulative effect method, there is only one practical expedient. Now I'll come to the practical expedients at a later stage, um, but what I'll do uh, first is to look at some of the key concepts, um, which I've just discussed, that's on the next slide. Um, and the key concepts that you need to just be aware of here are date of initial application, so the date of initial application is a term, it's defined in the new standards, and that's the start of the reporting period in which you first apply I4S 15. Practically, it's the date of the current period in which you adopt the financial. So um, it, it's the start of your period of adoption or the, or the year that you first apply I4S 15. The other concept, and this is really important, is the completed contracts concept. Contracts where you have transferred all the goods and services in accordance with the existing standard, in other words, IAS 18. So your current revenue um, recognition policies, if you've already performed and transferred all the goods and services under your current accounting standards, that is deemed to be a completed contract. And you'll see why that becomes important in a moment. The real concept behind that is if a contract has been completed by the time you transition to IFRS, by the time of the date of the initial application, the standard technically or, or effectively allows you to, to, to push it out, out of the restatement project. Why restate for a project that's already completed by the time you adopt the new standard? So, so those concepts are quite key. Completed contracts, we, are, we, we sort of push them out of the process. We don't really worry about them. That, 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 that's what the, what, what, the, what the standard setters have allowed us to do if we have got practical expedience. Um, and if we look to the next slide, I'll show you what you mean on the, on the approach to transition, putting all this into a timeline so you can see the practicalities of what we're getting at. If you're adopting the, the, the new standards, you'll have your comparative period that's presented in your financials and your cur current period. The date of initial application is going to be the date that we transition to IFRS 15, and that's really the start of your current period. For December year ends, it's going to be 1 January 2018. Um, for June year ends, it'll be 1 July 2018. Importantly, this becomes a bit more complicated if you do half year um, financial reports. So if you're a listed company and you're doing um, half year accounts, um, the concepts still apply, um, but there are some complexities about how you apply them. We won't be de dealing with those in this webinar, but just to make you alert that there are some complexities about how you apply this approach when you get to your half years. Now, running through those concepts um, that, that I dealt with before, the first day of the comparative period is obviously the date of the comparative year, so 1 January 2017 or 1 July 2017, depending on, on, on which way you go. Now, let's run through retrospective and cumulative effect method. Retrospective method, if you're applying the retrospective method, what's going to happen is you are going to present your restatement as if it happened on the first day of the comparative period. And, and most of us, us will be familiar with that concept. You do a prior year adjustment as if you were always accounting for um, the new standard right back to the beginning of the comparative period. Under the cumulative effect method, what will happen is you will make the adjustment at the date of initial application. So that'll be 1 January 2018 or 1 July 2018, depending on, 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 on when your year is. Please don't be um, caught by the trap to think, oh, it sounds easier if we're going for cumulative effect method because we're only making the adjustment at, at the date of initial application. That's just the date that you process the adjustment for the application of the transition. You still need to do the work to transition to it, and that does mean that you need to look at open contracts at the date of initial application and the effect of those open contracts before that date. It's just processing the adjustments through your financial at the opening, uh, at, the, uh, at the date of initial application. Um, that happens on 1, 1 July 2018 or 1 January 2018. Now, I think at this point what I'll do is I'll stop and we'll run the first poll to ask you which approach are you planning to adopt when transitioning to I4S 15? So Lita's gonna run the poll for us and I think it's up on the screen.
Yes, so you should be seeing the poll. So which approach are you planning to adopt? Um, so if you have had some discussions internally, you might have thought we want to do full retrospective method, or you would have thought let's do retrospective method with practical experience. Um, I'm not sure whether everybody's aware of the uh, for practical experience. You might have thought, listen, we want to do the cumulative effect method. And again, not sure whether you're um, aware of the practical expedient and there's only one available in that case. Or maybe you haven't made a decision yet, don't know. Hopefully, if you don't know, hopefully after this webinar, we've given you some food for thought and it would be able to assist you to make an informed decision on that. So fantastic, already while I was blabbering along, Kevin, 63% of people have voted of attendees. So I'll close that and I'll share the results. So what we see there, um, interestingly enough, 59% uh, of people don't know yet, and I really hope that between Kevin and I, we can assist you to make that decision. 17% um, thought the cumulative effect method with the practical expedient, 8% cumulative effect without the practical expedient, and together 16% of you thought fully retrospective. The, the benefit of fully retrospective is that you continue to provide comparable information to your users. Uh, if you do the cumulative effect method, your current year is the new standard, your comparative year is the old standard, and, and not all the not always um, the best co comparability that way. However, um, it's it's up for you to decide what's best for your organization and, and all these methods are allowed. Yeah, I'm interested at the don't know yet. Um, that's exactly what I was expecting. And, and and this webinar is then for you. Hopefully we'll arm you with the tools to make that 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 decision. Um, I think the other point that I was thinking of while Aletta was, was doing the results is, um, the, the the decision about which, which transitional method you adopt is also driven by, I guess, what your users want, and and maybe even what the industry is doing or the industry that you that that, that you exist in. Um, it's really not going to help anybody if the information that they require is compar comparability. So, for example, if if you really do need to see what last year was compared to this year, perhaps the full retrospective is where you need to go. Um, it isn't only about how easy it is or about or, 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 or about which one you want to do because it just seems easier. Um, you really do need to look at the, the users. So um, looking at the practical experience and, and, and the previous slide was, was, was the poll was a little bit of a test on whether you actually knew what the experience were. Um, the experience, there are four of them. Um, and the first four, or all four, are available under the full retrospective. Now, there's a lot of detail here, so I'll spend a bit of time, and I'll actually read through each of these with you. The first expedient is for completed contracts. So now you can see that key concept of completed contracts. So for com completed contracts, you do not need to restate um, the contracts that begin and end in the same annual reporting period or are completed at the beginning of the earliest year presented. That's a bit of a mouthful already, but what this is trying to do, and this expedient is available in the, ret the full retrospective method. What it means is if you've got a completed contract that starts and ends in the same annual reporting period, or it's completed by the time of your earliest year presented, then you don't need to worry about it. Effectively, what they're saying is if the complete, uh, contract is completed in the comparative year or completed by the time of, your, of the start of the comparative year, why bother? Why bother with it because it's gone? That's what they're really saying there. Now, the practical experience, you don't have to apply them. It's a choice. But if you do apply them, it's a choice per expedient. So if you choose, for example, to, to use practical expedient one, you must use it then for all contracts to which it applies. Okay, Pat practical expedient two also deals with completed contracts. So for completed contracts that have variable consideration, the entity can use the transaction price at the date the contract was completed, 
rather than estimating variable considerations along the way. This is why I made a big deal about variable considerations when a letter was doing the recap, because now you can see this variable concept coming through. What this expedient is saying, if in the comparative periods or before, you would have made decisions at various points that would have changed your estimation of what you expected the ultimate consideration to be. What this is saying is ignore those decisions you would have made along the way, just use the ultimate consideration or the, or the final consideration at the end of the contract when it was completed. So you don't go back and you, you, don't, you don't try and make, dis, uh, um, you don't try and make um, conclusions about what the estimate of the consideration would have been at each stage of the contract, just use the ultimate ending consideration, what you ultimately recovered. This also applies um, only for completed contracts. And that's very important. If the contract is not completed, by the time you transition to IFRS, this expedient doesn't apply. Now, practical expedient three, um, this is for contracts which had modifications. This is probably the more complicated one. Um, this one trips me up a little bit um, as well. What this one's going on about is if you had contracts where there were modifications, so this actually, this actually has, to, has to be accounted for as a modification. This is where you've got contracts where the terms and conditions changed and you're accounting for the contract as a modification. For contracts that were modified before the beginning of the earliest period presented, you shall reflect the aggregate effect of all modifications that occurs before the beginning of the earliest period. Um, when identifying satisfied and unsatisfied conditions, determining the transaction price and allocating the transaction price to the performance obligations. A huge mouthful. If you really read that, it, it probably makes no sense. If you read it in the standard, it's like le reading a legal contract, it's complicated. Um, but what we're really on about here is um, don't really look at the modifications that happened um, in the past before the, um, earliest period presented, really just account for the latest modification, the aggregate of the effect of it up to the earliest date presented. And, and we'll get to an example where we can actually demonstrate that. The fourth expedient is a disclosure expedient. That one I'm not going to get, get into much. Today is about the numbers. So uh, the, the fourth experience, uh, uh, practical expedient is a, um, a disclosure expedient. Now, practical expedients one, two, three, and four, four are all available on an expedient by expedient choice under the full retrospective method. Otherwise, if you're just going for the cumulative effect method, so in other words, if you're, if you're, if you're processing your opening adjustment at the date of initial application, the current period, only practical expedient three is available. Um, the other ones aren't relevant because because of when you're uh, 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 processing your adjustment. If you're processing your adjustment at the date of initial application of the current period, practical experience one, two, and four don't apply. So going back to our timeline, I think, I think to try and explain what each of these are trying to get at, we go back to our timeline. So if we are under the retrospective method, in other words, we are going to adjust our comparative period and present um, our comparative period as if IFRS 15 applies to all our contracts. We'll make our adjustment on the first day of the comparative period. So let's go through um, each of the expedients, practical expedient one. That one applied to completed contracts that you did not need to restate completed contracts that began or ended in the same reporting period or, or were completed before the date of the first first day of the comparative period. So really what we're saying with practical expedient one, any contract that began or started in the comparative period, you can scope that out, or any contract that was completed before January 2017 or July 2017, you can scope that out of the project. And it makes sense because it's gone. Practical expedient two, this one was for completed contracts that had variable consideration, um, which was completed in the comparative period effectively. So if a contract was completed in the comparative period and it had variable consideration, in other words, you were you were re-estimating or estimating your um, consideration along the way, you would have had to make estimation changes at each year end or, or, or at, at key stages during the, comp, uh, during the contract. What practical expedient two says is, 
take whatever the final consideration was at the end of the contract when it was completed and use that to restate your comparative period number. Practical expedient three, this one is the modification. And what this one's really saying is if there were modifications before the first day of the comparative period, don't worry so much about the modifications that would have happened. Um, really, you deal with the modification um, only in the comparative period. So, so you don't do re-estimations for each modification that had happened in the lead up to the first day of your comparative period. And like I said, practical expedient four, that one was a disclosure one. Now, at this point, hopefully we haven't lost too many people on the webinar. That can be uh, quite a quite quite a mouthful to try and digest. Um, so I think the best way to do it is to do some worked examples. Um, and we'll show you what we're on about now. You need to keep your wits about you here. There's numbers and there's information um, that, that, that we need to be on top of. The first example um, is just to show you the difference between the two methods being the retrospective and the and, and the cumulative. So let's have a look at the, the, the information. The difference between the two methods, the music company is our client or our, or our entity. They have a license of a Beethoven symphony. Um, they have licensed this to a customer. The customer has the right to use the recording for all types of advertising campaigns from 1 March 2017 to 28 February, February 2018. The customer is required to pay a thousand uh, currency or thousand dollars per month um, and the customer has the right to use the recording in its condition at the start of the license period. The transition date is 1 January 2018. So what we're looking at here is a December year-end client or December entity music company has a December year-end. Their first year under the new standard will be 31 December 2018. That means they are transitioning on 1 January 2018. That's the date of their initial application. All right. Um, and having a look at the way this transaction would have been recorded under the two methods, under current accounting standards, we would have probably recorded the revenue on a straight line basis over the contract. Under IFRS 15, for, for reasons which I won't go into today, this has got to do with licensing uh, and revenue uh, revenue under uh, a licensing of IP, but under IFRS 15, this would be recognized at a point in time. It would actually be recognized at the start of the contract. So yeah, we have a contract. Music company has licensed and recording. Under, under current accounting methods, they would have applied the straight line method of recognizing revenue. Under, the new, under IFRS 15, they would have to do it at the start of the contract. So they would have had to recognize the revenue in this contract on the 1st of March, 2017. Okay, so I think what we'll do here is just show you the numbers um, on the next slide. And the next slide just shows you that in the first line, if you were applying current revenue standards, you would have revenue of $10,000 in the first year in 2017 and the remainder of the contract would have given rise to revenue of $2,000 in 2018. So that's your percentage of completion um, of revenue recognition. Now, if we were applying IFRS 15, and we were applying it um, at the start of the contract under a retrospective method, in other words, we, we, we restate everything, we would have recognized that revenue at the start of the contract um, when they actually initially licensed the recording, which was 1 March 2017, which mean, means if you were applying revenue under IFRS 15 and you applied the full retrospective method, your revenue number for the 2017 year would have been the full amount, $12,000. You can re already see that that's what you would do if you applied um, uh, the full retrospective method is your comparative year would have a revenue number of $12,000 and nothing in 2018. If you apply the cumulative effect method, remember this one is you have to make an adjustment at the date of initial application. So the opening balance in the current year would get adjusted. Under that method, you don't touch what you did in the comparative year. So the revenue that you would re report in the revenue line is the $10,000. It's the same that would have been re uh, recorded under current accounting standards because we're not adjusting the comparative period. 
So now we have this thing that we actually have to do an adjustment on the date of initial application. There's your cumulative effect to catch up what should be the revenue number. The revenue number should have been 12. So what you do is you record an adjustment to your open and retained earnings in 2018 of two to catch up what you should have done to that open contract. This contract is an open contract, all right? Um, and, 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 and well, this contract is, is, is has, has to be restated because we haven't actually um, done the adjustments um, from the old method to the new method. So we have to make that cumulative effect to, to, to catch it up. We would do the 2000 adjustment on the 1st of January, 2018. What you will see here is that this contract will never have the full 12 recorded in the revenue line. It will have 10,000 recorded in the revenue line in 2017, if you're on the cumulative effect method, and a 2,000 adjustment to open retained earnings on the 1st of January, 2018. So the revenue will be 10 in the revenue line for 2017 and two in the open retained earnings for 2018. It's only under the full retrospective that you would have had the full 12 in the revenue line um, if you'd actually gone done a prior year adjustment in 2017. Kevin, I, I think uh, it's, yes. in, it's important that that point is extremely important because a lot of people say that in our business, that revenue number is important. And whenever we speak to users and analysts, they say they, they look at the revenue number. Uh, um, you know, so with the cumulative effect number, as you say, that 2000 that we adjust against opening retained earnings is never going to hit the, hit the revenue line, whether in the current year or the comparative year. Now, I know users and analysts will be more concerned about revenue in the current year. I get that. But ultimately, we miss out from a revenue perspective. So that is a disadvantage using the cumulative effect method um, if there's a sensitivity in your business around revenue. That's a very good point. Yeah. All right. Shall we then do our first poll? I think um, the first thing before we before we run the poll, just reminder of the of the of the various practical expedients. You've got PE one for completed contracts in the same period. PE two for completed contracts which had variable consideration. PE three was for modifications to contracts, and PE four was disclosure. So the question we're going to ask you now, applied to the music company example, would any of the practical expedients have been available? to music company? Would they have been available to music company? Alita is going to run this one for us again. I, I can't see the results of how many people have voted, but would any of these have been available to music company? All right, so we're having a look. I think a lot of people are thinking, um, voting is slow this time, Kevin. Um, so do you think any of these would have been available? This practical experience quite tricky. The first two around completed contracts, the third one basically around modifications, and as we know, the fourth one is a disclosure one. So we're just asking you the question about the first three at this stage. So Kevin, I think we should call it. We've got about 45% people have voted, so let's close it. I think it's a tricky one. If we share the results, you'll see that 51% of people said none of these would have been available. Um, some people thought uh, practical expedient one, two, and, and a few also for three. Uh, so that's a fairly interesting result. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the it was a bit of a trick poll, and I'm 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 not surprised to see the the wide variety. Um, there's a bit of information you didn't have there. So, for example, are you doing full retrospective or are you doing cumulative? Um, it doesn't really matter. The question was, are any of the, those available? The important bit was is that the contract's not yet complete. Um, under under the um, under the old accounting standards, we are still delivering, or uh, we are still delivering the use of that license over a period, and the and the license extends into the current financial year. So the contract isn't complete yet, which rules out 
practical expedient one and two. It's not yet complete. We might have recognized all the revenue, but the contract is actually, we are still delivering a performance obligation being the license period is open. Um, the only one that's actually available is PE3 modification. But in this case, there were no modifications. The contract hasn't been modified. So although it was available, it would never have been applied because there was never a modification to the contract. So in this scenario, um, the answer, whether you, applied the retrospective or cumulative method would have been the numbers we had up previously. With the retrospective method, you would have adjusted revenue completely into the current, into the prior year. With a cumulative effect, you would have had to make an adjustment to the opening balance in the current year. And on the um, pr practical expedience is one and two weren't available, it wasn't, com it wasn't complete. Three was available, but it didn't apply because there were no modifications um, and, and, and that's application to a very simple example. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy in some ways that, that there was a wide variety of answers demonstrating it's not an easy process. I, I, I actually think that the decisions that entities need to make about which process they apply to adopt the standard, there are so many variables that can come into it. Do you go full retrospective? Do you do cumulative? Do you apply any of the practical expedience? And very importantly, this is, um, uh, the, 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 the adoption of the new standards at a contract level, so contract by contract. So you can't really make a decision on the transition based on what one contract is, because if you apply a practical expedient to one contract, you've got to apply them to all contracts um, um, consistently. So lots of variables that come into it. Looking at our second example, um, we, we've only got 20 minutes left or so. So looking at our second example, um, We've got a entity A. Yeah, we have a customer where we have to provide software code for $1,000 on the 1st of February, 2017. Entity A de develops the code over a three month period and delivers the code on the 1st of May, 2017. Now, yeah, I'm gonna be more specific. I'm gonna say to you, we are transitioning on the full retrospective method. So we are going to uh, adjust our comparative year and our transition period is 1 January 2018. So just look at those dates before we, we, we do the poll. The code is developed over a three month period from 1 February to 1 May 2017. We transition to IFRS 15 on the 1st of January 2018. So the question we're gonna put up are, is any other practical expedience available to entity A? Same as before. Kevin, I've put it up uh, and we'll see what people think. I might say when I read this example the first time, um, the 1st of February got me confused. So it looks as we enter into the contract, we sign the contract on the 1st of February. And then three months later on the 1st of May, we deliver the code. Um, I think I might have misread it, Kevin. I, I hope other people got it no. right. Yep, um, I'll, I'll, I'll thought I'll flag that it's uh, maybe my own uh, slowness. <laughs> Let's see how people are going. 30% have voted to date. So which of these practical expedients do you think are available? Um, we'll get see if we can get to at least 40%. It's a tricky one. Have a go. Who cares? Just have a go. Uh, all right. So, oh, beautiful. We're now at 50%, uh, so let's see what people have been thinking. Yep, wonderful. And it, and, so, and it was an easy one, P1, 65%. Sorry, Alethea. No, that's fine. Sorry, Kevin, you run. Yeah, I hope so you can see the results. <laughs> I, can, I can see the results at 65% for P1, and that's correct because the first question you would ask is, is the contract completed? Um, and the answer is yes, we, we performed and delivered the code over a three month period in the comparative period. So it is completed in the comparative period. The next question you're gonna say is, um, is it completed in the, um, the same year, um, in the same annual reporting period? And that was yes, it was completed in the um, 2017 annual year. So what the standard says is practical expedient one is available to you. The contract was completed in the same 
annual reporting period, and that annual reporting period was our comparative period, throw it out. You don't need to worry about it um, if you adopt that one. You effectively remove it from the transition project. So you will not restate your comparative period for that contract. Now, it may seem a bit counterintuitive because um, the practical expedient, I guess, um, seems like it's by throwing the contract out or leaving it in, it's going to give you the same answer, but that's not always true because the revenue number you applied under IAS 18 might have been different to the one you would have applied under um, I4S 15, but it doesn't matter. Throw the contract out of the, uh, out, out of the project. You just, you kind of ignore it and, 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 and move on. All right. Now a tough one. Example three. This one is a little bit more tricky. So on the 1st of July, 2016, so this is now, this is now moving into the year, uh, the, the, the financial reporting period before the comparative period. So we've gone even further back. On the 1st of July, 2016, widget company signed a one-year contract to supply widgets for the following prices. So if the first 100,000 widgets would be sold at $10 a unit, the next 100,000 widgets would be sold at $9 a unit, and so on. At the 31st of December, 2016, $100,000 would have been delivered. Based on past experience, widget company would have estimated that its total sales volumes will be 200,000 with this customer. And then by the time the contract rounded out on the 30th of June, 2017, they had delivered 250,000 units. We've kept the transition date the same. So that's one January, 2018 is the date that we are transitioning under the full retrospective method. Now what's important here is that even though this contract is completed by the time we get to our current year, it's relevant to our transition because we're using the full retrospective method. We do need to adjust our comparative year for this contract, even though it's completed by the time we actually transition. I think I'm gonna ask a letter to put up the timeline. This one, this one only makes sense if you can sort of visualize it or it makes more sense to me if I can visualize it. So if I put the timeline up, this is, this is the facts on a timeline. We've got one January, 2017, um, 100,000 units were delivered. At that date, we were estimating that we would have actually delivered 200 to the customer based on our past experience. Now, this is the concept of estimating variable consideration. Under FRS 15, you would need to be making an estimation of how much you expect to sell to the customer and how much you therefore expect to earn from the customer all the way through, right from the start. So you need to know that information. You need to have that information under IFRS 15, or you need to make an estimate of that information. So even though we would have delivered 100,000 units on 1 January 2017, and we would have invoiced them ten, $10, $10 a unit, because that, that, that's the, that's the, 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 the layered um, pricing we had with them, we would have had to estimate our, 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 our variable consideration uh, that we expected, and we would have done so, let's say, at 200,000 units. By the time the contract ended in the comparative period, 250,000 uh, 250, units were delivered. So you can see our estimate on the 1 January 2017, we, we were out by 50,000 units. This is terribly complicated, because um, if you have a look, the way we would do it um, under current revenue standard, and um, if we hop to the next slide, under the current revenue standards, you would just recognize revenue as you sold the widgets. So effectively, the way revenue is recognized currently is we recognize it based on the amount we effectively invoice. So the first 100,000 widgets would have been invoiced at $10 a unit. That would have given us our revenue for 2016. In 2017, the financial year 2017, we would have sold the remaining 150,000 units. This is under current revenue standards, so it's really the invoice amount. And the way we would have got to the revenue in 2017, um, the first 100,000 units would have been sold at the $9 price, and, and then the, the remaining 50,000 units in 2017 would have been sold at $8 a unit. So there's the tiered pricing. First 100,000 at $10 a unit, next 100,000 units at $9 a unit, 
and so forth. So that's how you would do it under current accounting standards. If we hop to the next slide, I'm now going to show you what it looks like under IFRS 15. And I just see um, on the slide it says total revenue recognized under IS 18. That should actually say total revenue recognized under IFRS 15. What would have happened is we would have said, all right, how much do we expect to sell to this customer over the contract? Now, this is the concept of variable consideration. If we were applying IFRS 15 to the whole contract right from the start, we would have said we are expecting to sell 200,000 units. The first 100 would have been at $10 a unit. The second 100 would have been at $9 a unit. So we would have been expecting right at the start of the contract to really earn an average price of $9.50 over the period of the contract. And so when we sold the, the, the first 100,000 units, um, in 2016, we would have actually had a revenue number of 950,000. This concept blows a lot of people's mind because they'll say to you, well, hang on, the invoice price is $10 a unit for the first 100. But the, the revenue standard requires you to estimate the amount you expect under the contract. So step one, have a contract. Step two, what are your performance obligations? Step three, what is the transaction price? The transaction price is the amount you expect under the contract, which is then allocated to the performance obligations. So you would be recording a variable price right from the start. You would have had 950,000 units if you were applying the revenue, the new revenue standard to this contract in prior years, which means by the time you get to 2017, there's going to be an adjustment and a cumulative catch up to account for the fact that you estimated the wrong number of units. You would have estimated 200,000 units in 2016. By the time you got to the end of the contract, there were 50,000 more. So there would be an adjustment um, in 2017 that relates to the 2016 year. The total revenue is still the same. Over the contract, you still got two, 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 thousand, uh, two million, 2.3 million, but it's the year that the revenue falls into that's different because you would have been estimating your expectation along the way. If you didn't get any of that, you can take these notes and go work it out after today's uh, se session. The, the numbers are there so you can go play around with the numbers, but it's just demonstrating that you would have had to uh, estimate your expectation of revenue all the way through the contract. And that's what IFRS 15 is about, estimating along the way. Okay, mouthful. If we look at the timeline now, we are now doing transition. Remember transition is 1 January 2018. So that's the date we are transitioning. That's our date of initial application. We are adjusting our comparative period for this co contract because we are applying full retrospective. We have chosen to do full retrospective. The poll is, are any of the practical expedients available? And I do not expect a lot of people to attempt this one. I think it, it's, it's a tough one. A letter? A tough yeah, one. it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, I, I, and I think you've now further scared people, Kevin. Um, <laughs> I would say have a go. Uh, think about these facts and have a go with the four practical expedients. Um, the numbers are interesting. And that's why when we talk about entities who have um, variable pricing structures um, uh, based on volumes, etc., specifically, you know, there's tremendously difficult calculations that have to be done. And the question is whether your systems and processes can actually deal with that. Um, Kevin, people are going to surprise you at this stage. I've got 40% have already voted. Um, oh, maybe, if, maybe if I keep quiet, I can give them time to think a little bit. Yep. I, I think, let, let, let's see what they come with. I, I think they're getting used to it now, so that's okay. Right, so we've hit the 50% mark. 50% of people have voted, which is incredible. Um, and Kevin, you're going to love it when I show you uh, the results. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's really, really interesting. So um, the results of the contracts will... will We've got a bit of a mixture here. PE2 seems to be the winner at 47%. Um, 
So the question we really have to say to ourselves is, first of all, do we have a completed contract by the time we transition? Yes, we do. The contract was completed in the comparative year. So the, the next question is for PE1, was it completed in the same annual reporting period? Um, and the answer was no. The contract extended from the 2016, uh, from, from, from uh, July 2016, across the year end into the 2017 and uh, into the uh, 2017 financial year. So the contract wasn't completed in the same annual reporting period. So PE1 doesn't apply. PE2, that does apply to completed contracts. Um, was it um, completed before we transitioned? Yes. And was there variable consideration? In other words, would we have had to estimate the amount we expected at various stages through the contract? Yes, we had to we had to, we had to do an estimation um, at the end of 2016. That was when we thought there were 200,000 units to be sold. What the, what the what the expedient says is that is a variable consideration because the com uh, contract is completed by the time we transition, PE2 is applicable. We can apply PE2 by actually saying, all right, let's not worry about all those estimation points before, we'll just take whatever the final consideration was and apply that to the contract. So if we hop to the next slide, a letter, I think we'll show you in the numbers the effect this has. The effect this has is um, quite dramatic Let's wait for that to come up. Sorry, that's the practical experience. You're looking for this, Kevin. Yeah, that's right. So looking at the numbers, and once again, you can take these numbers and go and play with these yourselves um, when when the webinar is over. Under IS18, under current revenue, we were recognizing revenue at the invoice amount. So 2016 was a million dollars, 2017 was 1.3 million. None of these contracts have a 2018 impact because it's a completed contract in the comparative year. So this is all about transition. So what's happening in the prior year? If you had done the retrospective under IFRS 15 and applied it fully, you would have actually had to make an estimate at the end of 2016, adjust your contract for your expectation that existed at that date, which was the 200,000 units. And then 2017, you would have actually made an adjustment to show what the ultimate final consideration was with the cumulative adjustments that followed. With the retrospective using the practical expedient too, what effectively happens is you, you are allowed to say, I know that the 2.3 million was my total consideration. I know that that happened at the, uh, uh, when the contract was completed. Assume that we knew that all the way from the beginning. In other words, you are able to take the um, the, the, the weighted average of $9.2 a unit. And what's it saying is you know there were 2.3 million units sold. You know that you sold 250,000 units. Therefore, you know the average price for all the units over the entire contract. Assume you knew that right from the start of the contract, which means just recognize um, the number of units sold in each year at the final average price per unit. Effectively, you're smoothing the numbers. I hope at least the point came through, even if the numbers aren't clear, um, but really it's just take your final consideration divided by the number of units sold and assume that that's what the selling price was in each period based on the units sold in each of those period. And that's the practical expedient. You're effectively using what you know at the end of the contract and applying it back. And I think the interesting thing is in that um, poll, some people suggested that practical expedient three is available. And I think the confusion is whether this volume um, structured, uh, I don't know if you call it a volume discount, um, is actually variable consideration and not a modification. Uh, so if we've got modifications, then pr a practical expedient three would have been available. In this case, it's variable consideration and, and therefore it's, it's practical expedient two. That's really important, Aleta, because we didn't modify the contract. The contract was agreed at the start. So those, those tiered pricings wasn't a modification to the contract. The contract, those, it was a, that was part of the original terms of the contract. 
Correct. So I think when we look at transitioning to IFRS 15, so many people said they haven't really made the decision yet. Um, the considerations, and, and we've tried to illustrate with worked examples, if you look at the cumulative effect method, um, I think there is a perception that it's less effort and it requires less information, um, which could be true in certain instances, uh, but there's still a lot of work involved. Um, there's comparative, the comparative figures remain unchanged. It's still whatever you've done under IS 18. Um, it does, um, you know, impair the comparability of the current year to the comparative year. So that's a big downfall. And it, it could obscure trends and variants variance analysis. Um, if you look at the retrospective method, yes, more information is required. Um, it enables comparability, which is a good thing, especially for listed entities. Um, it provides relevant information if you look at trends and variance analysis, um, and also then allows the use of all practical expedients where the cumulative effect method, we only have the one practical expedient, the modification one that's available. And so there's so many things things to consider and I think in the end entities will have to run the numbers using the alternative methods uh, in essence before they make a final decision. So there's a huge amount of work required. Uh, I think that's the moral of the story. Our last example, example four, is around modifications. Um, so I'll hand back to Kevin to look at that and then we'll look at next steps. Yeah, so this example I actually wasn't planning to do with you. It's quite in depth and detail. It's, it's actually a worked example for you to take with you and, and try on your own. It is clearly a modification example. So if I run through it just very briefly, yeah, we have a contract data company. It's a three-year data processing contract um, in 2014. Um, the, con the parties then agreed to extend the contract for another year and there's a new price set for that extra year in 2015 and then another variation to the contract in 2016. Now, this demonstrates clearly that because they renegotiated the contract and the terms of the contract, um, there would be potential modifications. And, and the big decision that you need to be, make here is, is it a termination of the previous contract each time and a new contract, or is it a modification to the previous contract? Um, so you can take this one away and, 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 and work through it yourself. Um, looking at then the, the, the next slide on the PE 1, 2, 3, and 4, Clearly, PE3 is an option. PE3 being we've got a contract that was modified before we transition, and it was modified uh, at various stages before we transitioned and before the comparative period began. And then, if you look at the numbers um, on the final slide, and and and. And, and, and your homework, I guess, is to try and figure out how we got these numbers, but I'll tell you how we got them. So under, under the revenue standard, current revenue standard, really that would have just been the invoiced amount um, that we would have, um, uh, would, have, would have invoiced. The full retrospective, if you were applying the retrospective, what you would have done is you would have actually gone and worked out the revenue in each year, and you would have then if you were applying IFRS 15, you would have had to apply the modification rules in the new standard to each time you made a change or a new contract negotiation, and then you would have adjusted the revenue numbers as you went. If you apply the practical expedient, what it actually says is, you know the last modification you made, you know the last contract that existed, apply that as if you'd always known it going back. So you can see the moral of the story here is if you apply the the, 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 the practical expedient three under the full retrospective method, you're getting an equal revenue number in each year. And there's the benefit of the expedient. The benefit of the expedient is you effectively applying hindsight. You know ultimately what the last modification was. You know ultimately what the, what the, final, dis, uh, the final numbers are gonna be. Applying it as if you always knew that right from the start, you'd actually get an, uh, effectively an equal spread of revenue over those years. You can see how important that expedient could be. Instead of trying to do apply the standard every time there was a contract renegotiation, you kind of just ignore them until the final one and you apply that equally across, uh, across the years. That will make transition for this contract a whole lot easier. Um, knowing that information. So you can go work that, uh, do that worked example yourself, but that's the moral of the story is PE3 gets, allows you to spread 
to spread what you know to make it easier to transition. And you can see also that this is just, this contract is live still in 2018. So this contract does exist into my current year. It's not a completed contract, but it had modifications in the past. It's how you apply what you know now to the past as, a, as an expedient to help you make the transition easier. Thank you very much, Kevin. So if we talk about next steps, um, definitely one of the most important decisions that you have to make in the year of transition, transitioning to IFRS 15 is what transition method you want to use. And that's why we started with this webinar in February. And then in March, we'll follow on with webinars on problem areas and implementation issues and risk assessment. Um, because we just wanted to flag up front that this is a key decision and really important that you start to think about this decision. Um, we've looked at the considerations and the things to think about earlier. If you need any assistance, um, a, a publication, and you would have seen this morning when you received the email with the PowerPoint slides, we've also attached this uh, BDO publication. Uh, it's been prepared by BDO Global. Um, it's around... Uh, you know, 24 pages with examples, explanations on transition, so you can make an informed decision. Uh, you can also get it from our BDO in Australia website. Um, and then the topics that we will cover going forward, uh, we look at transition. We've looked at transitional requirements today on IFRS 15. We'll also look at the transitional requirements for IFRS 9 and 16 later on in the year. Uh, next month we'll look at risk assessment around IFRS 15, and then we look at problem areas around IFRS 15. Um, there will be some webinars around getting ready for 30 June and 31 December 2018, and then you can register for further webinars on our website. So we've got a big team. As I've said before, Wayne Basford is the partner based in Perth and Clark Gerald, the partner in Brisbane. And Kevin um, is our principal in Sydney. Um, I'm based in Melbourne and I'll also look at our other, uh, look after our other national offices. So please feel free to contact us if you would like to discuss any of this. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're looking forward to speak to you again next month uh, and we'll continue on our journey on transitioning to IFRS 15, 9 and 16 over the coming years. Thank you very much.